Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor-at-large of The Hill. It's great to be with all of you today at another edition of the Brussels Forum. Our task today is to talk about the topic, reimagining democracy. I sort of feel like we could also talk about restoring democracy or re-anchoring democracy. You pick, uh, you pick what you would like to, to have this, this mean in terms of talking about the democratic challenge today and we can live with it. I think we're gonna hit a lot of corners of this. We have a wonderful panel with us. One of our panelists uh, is still on the way, but I think he will appear. Uh, but with us today, we have Jonathan Katz, who's a senior fellow and director of Demo uh, Democratic Initiatives at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Uh, we have Karen Jemten, who's director, or I should say Jemtin, uh, is director general of the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. We have Mark Malik Brown, who's had every cool international job out there, uh, but also served his country well in the UK. Mark Malik Brown is president of the Open Society Foundations, of, former, of course, formerly the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations under, under Kofi Annan, uh, head of the UN Development Program. And he really uh, is a is a is an outstanding leader when it comes to much of the, the many of the topics we'll be discussing today on multilateral institutions and what are their role uh, in these stressed out global times. Uh, and we have uh, uh, Gia, uh, Mircea Gianna, who is Deputy Secretary General of NATO. Uh, Mircea was also the uh, former president of the Senate in Romania, former ambassador to the United States, a very distinguished figure both in security and civil society discussions around the world. Look, yesterday, as we know. President Biden met uh, President Putin in Geneva, and you know President Biden kind of snapped at one of my journalistic colleagues, but he kind of went off a little bit on on how we're all so negative. But in his comments on the tarmac, uh, President Biden made a profound statement. He said, um, "Every generation has to reestablish the basis of its fight for democracy. I mean, for real, we literally have to do it." And so I want to go to Mark to begin with to help set the stage of this question. As we talk about democracy, I almost feel that that you know, until I read President Biden's comments, that sometimes, despite January sixth, despite what we see in Belarus, there's a casualness about this discussion. And I'm wondering if you think, you know, that 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 our uh, 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 you know the the passion that we have at this is at the right tempo to really look at what it is going to take to re-secure democracy in these times, or, or whether we still need to wake up to some of the challenges that are unfolding. Steve, look, I think it's absolutely you're putting your finger on it. It's sort of been an accumulated crisis where, you know, every time another leaf falls, we don't see that the pile has grown higher, but you know, Freedom House, points out that over 15 years, we've seen a steady decline in democracy around the world and in human rights. And look at the aggregate figure today. Most of the world now lives in a country, in countries which are not uh, designated as democratic. Um, you know, huge population centers, Russia, China, but, you know, also countries, you know, where there is a kind of very constrained and limited democracy, uh, uh, you know, such as modern day Turkey, or even, uh, you know, arguably Brazil. And so, you know, it's a very, very changed world. The heady days of the 1990s and early 2000s, when there seemed to be a democratic tide sweeping the world, has been thrown into serious reverse. And you mentioned Belarus, one could also say Myanmar, potentially down the road, Afghanistan after the US withdrawal. The dominoes are falling and they're falling the wrong way. And, you know, I, I think leading a, an organization like Open Society Foundations, you know, where are, we're invested so heavily in democracy and human rights, you know, we view the tide is run, running the wrong way, we're on our, back, on our back foot, we're battling to protect rather than to promote uh, further gains in democracy at the moment. Well, thank you for that. Let me jump to Jonathan. And while I'm doing that, welcome to Mircea Giona, the Deputy Secretary General of NATO. Uh, Mircea, I just introduced you to everyone. It's awesome to have you with us today. But Jonathan, I guess my question is, we look at now, how do you put the building blocks back together? As, yeah. as Mark said, you know, we're on our heels. We need to take this seriously. We've got to jump forward. But when you sort of look at that challenge, um, I guess my question is, if you're sitting as I am now in Slovakia, or you look at those allies we've had that say, wow, the G7 is back. They see green sprouts of American leadership uh, again at NATO. Uh, but would you blame them if they had a little bit of doubt 
after four years of, of a, a White House that was spitting on those very multilateral institutions, which I know many of you think are so vital to this to this time and this challenge. Jonathan? Yeah, no, that's that's a constant refrain that we hear concerns about what that Trumpism is not is not gone, come back. Um, and that you can see the the devastation wrought in terms of U.S. engagement in multilateral organizations, democracy globally over the last four years. Uh, but Mark pointed out that this didn't start just in the in the Trump Trump administration during that period. This has been ongoing. Uh, those right. Freedom House scores talk about 15 years of Democratic backsliding. And I think President Biden, you point to that speech on the tarmac, and I'd every everybody should sort of really look at that. He points to January 6th, and he says, mm -hmm. I can't believe that that happened. And I right. think so the, the impact of that is huge, uh, but you're already seeing quickly, I think the U.S. Uh, you know, is back again five months into the administration. You're seeing, you know, at these summits, all of these summit communiques are so heavily laden with a democracy focus. And I think a lot of people five months ago doubted that European partners and allies, G7 partners, others globally, would start to move back into this direction. But I think it's been a success for this administration. Uh, but the hard work is about to come because uh, you have to fulfill those agreements. Those are just communiques that their language on paper. So we'll see. That's great. Marcia, I'm going to jump to you next and then to and then to Karen. Um, and feel free to, as I told everyone, to jump on each other and interact um, on, on what each of you say. And I should also tell our audience, we're already getting some very good questions. So feel free to send them in uh, and they'll be fed my way. But, but Michelle, you know, one of the, I want you to take off your Deputy Secretary General hat for a minute. You know, you and I talked in the middle of the COVID crisis and you highlighted things about partnership in America with Romania that I didn't know about, about flights, that there was more going on beneath the surface collaboratively than much of the world saw. But let me ask you the question to ask that I, that I just asked Jonathan Katz. If you want to feel your, your neighborhood, our mutual allies in NATO, wanted to feel the robustness of re-engagement of America around democratic values and norms, what would be those elements on that list that you think we have to check off those boxes as opposed to just kind of going incrementally and from by inertia into this? Uh, Steve, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks for having me and uh, it's a pleasure to see you even, you know, still virtually. Listen, I'm still under the uh, euphorical impression of the very successful NATO summit we had just last Monday here uh, mm. in NATO headquarters. And I do not believe that summit was incremental. I think it was a major leap towards our continuous relevance as an alliance, uh, towards our permanent adaptation, and what makes this NATO alliance so unique? We always say with great pride, the most successful uh, alliance in human history. Even President Biden is repeating this quite, quite often. Because we always manage to put together two indispensable ingredients. Number one, common values and democracy and rule of law and respect from individual freedom, your right to choose your leaders, your right to choose your life, your right to choose as a nation what kind of organization you like to join. That's the number one glue, if you want, of this alliance. And the other one is, of course, the ones of permanent adaptation and relevance, because you have to move forward with times that are changing. What I think that President Biden has done in this, you know, sequence of high level engagements over the last few days, he started not only with G7, we looked at G7 because it's G7, that's the name of the, uh, of, the, of the format. But President Biden and Prime Minister Boris Johnson, they invited India, Japan, South Korea, and South Africa. Only a few years ago, we are talking about the BRICS. Remember the BRICS, the acronym? Sure. Now we are basically moving into something else. And then President Biden came to NATO. He rallied his European allies and Canada. And then he went to see the European Union leadership. And then he went to see President uh, Putin in, 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 in Geneva. So I'm saying that there is a both a moral imperative for us to defend our values. It's also an organizing principle of a democratic political West. Without this, we have absolutely uh, uh, no 
competitive advantage when we talk about our ethical fight with authoritarian counter propositions to how to organize human societies. So in a way, both from a moral, from a practical, from a strategic, from a tactical viewpoint, we have to do something about this. Coming, coming from a country that lived under communism not only a few decades ago, can it, I can I also tell you something else. And I think sometimes we are also complacent. And probably the events, the dramatic, traumatic events in, in Washington on January 6th, this is a trauma also for me as a Romanian. I think this is a trauma for all the friends of America and all the friends of democracy worldwide. We realize that even the most robust, the, if you want the flagship of democratic world, is so fragile. So my, 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 my word of, of caution, of concern, and a hope that I have with you, taking off my uh, DSG hat from NATO, is that democracy is work in progress, that our public opinions are many times discontent for the right reasons, that of course our adversaries try to amplify this, this, uh, these fractures, micro or macro fractures in our societies, but in the end it's up to us to continue to modernize our democracies, to regain the trust of our public opinions. And this is, in fact, what political leadership is, is supposed to be doing. Internationally, President Biden, Biden is doing exactly the right thing that he was supposed to be doing. Thank you for that. Karen, let me uh, ask you uh, a similar question, but from a different perspective. You look at, at development, you look at aid, you look at the kind of broad uh, level of multilateral organizations working together, you know, as a, a vital part of the picture. And, and these institutions have been pushed back on their feet. I've talked and interact with many of them. I think morale has been low the last four years. I'm interested in what you feel needs to be put on the agenda to revitalize the strength and role of global cooperation, strength and role of multilateral organizations, much to what Mark Malik Brown just shared. Tell, tell us what your agenda is um, and what do you need? Many things, but I would actually not, I, I will not start by answering your question, but rather responding to, to my, uh, the panelists, uh, friends sure. on the panel here and take off my hat as an agent, leader of a government agency in Sweden. Democracy has, as Mark pointed out in the beginning, the, the belief in democracy has declined over the fifth, last 15 or so years, but also the trust in democracy to deliver to deliver jobs, to deliver healthcare, education, or whatever. And in the long run, or rather very rapidly, we have to make the democracies deliver for everyone in societies. Deliver uh, good healthcare now, it's evident in, in, in the wake of the, of the pandemic, but also in other areas. And I think that we have, and I'm now putting on other hats from my, from my historic, from my past, we have underestimated how people in all our countries, also Sweden, feel put aside by leadership in our societies. And the disbelief for the decline in trust in democracies is mm -hmm. based on our societies not delivering as firmly as before. And we have not been able to, to provide sort of a positive view on the future in the democracies. So that is the biggest, to my, my eyes any, anyways, to my view, the biggest challenge for everyone wanted, wanting to work with democracies. Of course, press, it's a right for everyone to be allowed to, to, to say, to organize yourself or put the vote in a ballot box, but it's also a right for everyone to get the promises delivered by the politicians elected. For us, we work with, with trying to support the, the creation or the, the strengthening of the democracies in other countries. And I think that our biggest challenge is actually to be allowed to have very long-term goals. It takes 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, if I look back at Swedish development cooperation, one wrong thing with it was leaving South Africa too early. We said it's all done, 1994, there is a democracy, the constitution is fantastic, they've had the fantastic elections, etc., etc. We should have stayed and continued to work with building of trust and strong institutions in the country to support that process. When it comes to the multilateral institutions, Many of them deliver very strongly, but we expect them also to be able to stand up 
for the values of the United Nations or of the multilateral banks or whatever multilateral in institutions we have. For the multilateral in institutions to be able to do that, the individual members, i.e. countries, have to give them that possibility. And then mm. we're back to the individual voter in the individual country giving um, thoughtful and brave leaders the possibility to actually press the multilateral system. Well, thank you for, for that. Mark, let me jump, jump back to you for a moment, both to, to kind of broaden this discussion, but I think whether you look at Europe where I'm sitting now and, and uh, uh, we see uh, a, a fairly illiberal leader like Viktor Orban in Hungary, we see in NATO, Turkey is there. If you look at the German Marshall Fund's recently just released um, public attitude surveys, you know, there's not a lot of trust between Turkey uh, and the NATO, NATO and, and particularly the U.S. objectives in this. And I'm just interested in if there's a Mark Malik Brown pay, playbook. You know, it, you can you can draw lines and say we're not going to talk to somebody. But how I mean, I hate to put it this way, but how do you seduce them back so they believe in what Karen and Jonathan just shared and, and, and Maciej Genoa, that they that they that they buy the project, they see it's delivering as opposed to becoming a federation of tribes with each tribe trying to knock each other out. Mark? Look, it's a good, very good question, Steve. And I think, you know, Karen half answered it, uh, you know, by, by making the really important point that democracy has got to be seen to deliver. You know, I like her example about Sweden, which was such a powerful force in funding the liberation movements in Southern Africa, mm. with hindsight pulling out too far, but it's also, you know, we were, OSF remained very engaged in South Africa, as in fact Sweden is too, but, um, you know, our, George Soros, who started us, you know, in the case of South Africa said, okay, we've got this problem of how do you build a black middle class in South Africa? Mm -hmm. And interestingly, his approach was not to sort of go and argue for rights legislation, there were lots of other people doing that. He started a mar housing market for black South Africans mm -hmm. by funding black mm -hmm. housing construction through revolving loans. And, you know, so he understood immediately that that link that democracy must deliver. There was this massive pent up aspiration demand by black South Africans that needed to be met and addressed. And it was imperfectly met and addressed. And now there's frankly a crisis in South African democracy in some ways, but you know, you've got to deliver in that way. But I think also the other point is, you know, multilateral institutions can't just become battering rams for democracy. They need to, you know, incorporate their full membership. You know, it's important that Turkey stays in NATO, even, you know, though it does not meet the democratic norms one would wish to see. Um, but, you know, it, you know and, and that's even more true of the UN. I mean, I get quite alarmed when, you know, I hear American leaders talk about Sort of making the UN a vehicle for the democratic half of the world versus China. You know, mm -hmm. we, we've both got to promote democracy, but we've also got to keep a universal conversation going, uh, an inclusive conversation of everybody. And I think actually, as the world is getting so polarized, we're seeing a strange jump in um, options on the UN. I'm amazed at how many problems mm -hmm. my colleagues say. Mm -hmm can you give us an access point at the UN? Because, you know, the US and China are so butting heads or, you right. know, that often it is the multilateral approach, which is the only one which gets a bit of oxygen mm. for progress. Mm. So, you know, now people are turning to the UN for uh, the post uh, US Afghanistan. Uh, it's the UN envoy who's looked to, to try and get some kind of dialogue going in mm. Myanmar. It couldn't play that role if it just became a standard bearer for, for democratic, the democratic approach alone. Well, Mark, you've mentioned China and we have so many questions. Dr. Bob Polly has asked about how can the EU and NATO best you know, work the China question on democracy given what we've seen in Hong Kong uh, and given what we've seen is outrageous abuses like Xinjiang and the Uyghurs uh, and whatnot. And Ned Wiley has asked uh, lots of talk about NATO summit about China but President Macron puts out that, that, that NATO is an Atlantic focused alliance. So what, you know, what's the connection to Asia? So I guess, you know, in the, you will have to work these out, but I'd love to hear from <clears throat> Giona, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary General of NATO this time with his hat on, but also Jonathan Katz, you know, as you think about um, illiberal regimes out there, you know, this is where I had hoped topics like climate change or some of the 
great migration crises uh, and refugee crises in the world, these big transnational global problems that take everyone's uh, you know, shouldering in, including countries like China and Russia and others, I thought that would create an opportunity for overlap of interest. But there seemed to be growing divides. So, uh, Mircea, uh, uh, Mircea, would you like to jump in and then Jonathan? Sure. Listen, um, of course, there was lots of uh, attention, like, like almost never before, to a final communique of an international organization like NATO. I have uh, seen in, in many years so much media interest in looking to, uh, to the wording and the language that our leaders have agreed. So what you read in this final communique of the NATO summit, it's consensualized language from all allies, from all allies, because we work by consensus. So we have to make sure that we, 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 we strike the right balance. Listen, where we are coming from as NATO and where also I'm coming from as as, uh, as somebody has spent a little bit of time in, into international affairs and politics. First, competition, which is going to continue to intensify, should not preclude cooperation and dialogue. Because there are some, uh, some, some issues uh, that we need global cooperation even if we don't see eye to eye or even we are competing harshly on many other fronts there are the issues of climate change the issues of the pandemic there are issues of formulating global norms for the issues that are not yet regulated internationally mm. like cyberspace has basically no international rules and norms outer space has something from the 60s or 70s there are lots of things that we we'll need to work together, including with countries that do not share our values and with, 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 with whom we also have intense right. competition. <laughs> right. In a way, the way in which President Biden is approaching these things, both with Russia and with China, on different levels, mm -hmm. it's exactly that. OK, listen, we don't agree on many things, but can we agree that we need some form of predictability in the way in which we organize the architecture of world affairs and i think this is in a way the challenge we have yeah and i do believe that competition and collaboration and dialogue with russia we do it we, we call it in nato in our jargon dual track approach deterrence and defense mm -hmm. very robust you're doing things we are taking measures to defend our people and our territories at the same time we are waiting the nato russia council to reconvene I've right. made four offers to Russia to come back to the to the dialogue table. So I hope that there is room for competition, defending our values, defending our principles, but also collaboration, because that's a world that needs that needs also some predictability and some stability in, 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 in some form. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that last point is is correct. And I and I certainly think that um, there are areas uh, where the Biden administration, particularly, you've seen an openness to work on, whether it's climate change. Uh, China sat at the table when the president hosted a climate summit uh, in April. Uh, and I think there's other areas, common spaces, where there will be conversations. But I just wanted to go back to what, what, what Karen said about commitment to uh, democracy and sort of continuously feeding and supporting its growth, because I think that's important. Karen pointed out a... Uh, uh, South Africa, but I could also point to the U.S. pulling back uh, in places, including in Central Europe. You mentioned Hungary before, mm -hmm. V4 countries. Um, and, and I think it's really important that when we look even at China, too, that, that a continuous um, investment in democracy without ending, it should be something that we consistently do. I know uh, CETA does and the Swedish government, uh, but we really need to be looking carefully uh, we almost need an early warning system now for, for backsliding democracies. And one thing I'm not hearing in the conversation on China is, uh, is democracy uh, and also the Chinese people. We talk a lot about uh, the Russian people who are being oppressed right now. Uh, there's an election this year. It's not going to be a free and fair election uh, in any means. But thinking about the competition of democracy in Asia, um, the, I, Turkey was mentioned before. I think it's been a mistake for the United States, which has focused so heavily on security uh, that, it, that it missed uh, the opportunity over the last several decades to really engage Turkey on democracy. And I would say the same thing for the EU as well. 
So I just want to add competition right. and democracy is important. I want to jump to Mark with a big question, but before I do that, uh, John, I Isabel Ioannidis um, asked a question, if you could just give a short slice of an uh, answer. I'm wondering how Erdogan's Turkey fits the NATO 2030 framework for shared values and democracy. You mentioned Turkey. Can you give us your view of how Turkey should be approached real fast? Is, is this for me or is it? Yeah, for you. I'm, okay. I'm asking you a follow on. You had just mentioned yeah, Turkey. No, so I think, quick I, I quick think, follow on. Give me uh, yeah. 30 seconds on that. Yeah, Tur Turkey, you know, this, this issue of Turkey's democracy, I know the Biden, uh, the Biden Erdogan meeting didn't really produce a lot of news, uh, but I know that this administration is really concerned about human rights, about freedom of press and democracy. You know, NATO needs to figure out, and I'm not gonna to speak, we obviously have somebody, a very senior level NATO official, but NATO itself really needs to figure out how it deals with, with uh, you know, countries within NATO that are democratic backsliders or, or, or turning towards autocracies. I really think that, the, that when we have these weak links internally within these security structures, our collective defense is weakened. So it needs to be high on the agenda. Um, and I think if you look at polling numbers in Turkey, you see the Turkish public is split. Uh, so democracy is strong internally. They just have a leader right now that doesn't necessarily believe in democracy. Thank you. Mark, I want to uh, throw a left you know, curveball um, at you and have all of you respond. I was up in Davos uh, when we were still meeting in Davos. Uh, George Soros, some years ago, laid out his concerns about major social media platforms and how destructive they were to democracies. Um, he anticipated in so many ways and may have kicked off the debate that we're having now today about many of these platforms. A year later, he was the one before most of the world had kind of tuned into Huawei uh, in issues about technology, artificial intelligence. And you know, much to like Brad Smith, the, C the president of Microsoft has written that they can be tools or weapons. You know, George said in some parts of the world, they're being used as in weaponized way against their own populations and thus again, undermining democracy. I often find these democracy discussions don't involve those sorts of elements. And I'm wondering, is open society uh, in trying to, as it sort of looks at multilateral institutions, to approach those areas that, that George put on the table. Um, would love to get your reactions and other reactions from the panel. Thanks, Steve. And just one comment on Turkey in response to Jonathan. You know, actually, I think Biden missed a real opportunity uh, mm. in the Erdogan meeting. There are a list of very prominent individuals who are imprisoned in Turkey. Apparently, he didn't raise any of them with Erdogan. And I think that is, you know, actually sh close to shameful. Um, mm. But just mo mo moving on to, 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 to your point. Yes, Steve. I mean, I think, you know, to, to sort of view the threats to open society or democracy as solely today coming from governments is to miss half the problem. You know, half the prob the other half of the problem is changes in our political economy, which have created, you know, a lot of corporate and financial interests, which have escaped national level regulation and often not malignly or, un or intentionally, but nevertheless contributed to dramatic increases in inequality within countries and between countries. And then mm -hmm. the very special case of the social media, which is a global platform escaping a lot of regulation, weak self-regulation structures of its own, not really accepting responsibility for the content, uh, content uh, it, it puts on that platform, and, and it having undermined the business model of traditional journalism with people mm. like you who check their sources. At least I think right. you still do, to Steve. You <laughs> I, do, I, do. I think you still check your I always double check you. Um, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, so, we have indeed wise widened our, our, our sort of our targets, if you like, from just governments to these other threats to human rights and freedoms. Right. Uh, and we think some of them are quite insidious because some of them are perfectly benign CEOs who don't even understand uh, the impact their businesses are having on, say, the pattern of global inequality. And I think this very final point, you know, the whole model that of, of human rights promotion of the 80s and 90s and early 2000s of shaming governments to live up to their responsibilities is broken. You can't shame the governments. And if some of these threats come from social media and other actors, there's no point in even trying to shame the governments alone. So I think looking at much more robust strategies of 
tackling economic interests. So you take right. China and the Uyghur. Well, yeah. China's vulnerability may not be complaining directly to it about human rights so much as really going right. after its international economic profile to squeeze and push and try and incentivize China to change its behaviors. Well, thank you. Karen, let me ask you, you know, again, about the building blocks and what we can shape in the system to be cooperative, that you work so much in the private sector, you've talked about private sector partnerships, mm. at least in the United States, I don't know the global situation, ESG investing, you know, mm. revolutions in governance, mm. you know, trying to think through how they can be better has sort of emerged and i think mm. some of them some of that is greenwashing and mm. some of it is real, real. but when yeah. you look at multilateral institutions and mm. governments and private mm. sector what are the elements there that you think we need to add to this equation um i don't know if we we need to add new organizations as such but we need to right. have better collaboration between the multilateral development banks mm. the united nations systems and other multilateral institutions the norms are set in certain parts of the multilateral systems and the project pipelines, so to say, are created in, in the, the banks, more or less. I'm making mm. a simplistic picture. Uh, so we have to have more, organi more organized work together within mm. the multilateral system. We work a, less, a lot, as you say, with institutional investors, but also with other parts of the private sector. We have good, good, very good talks and work together with the World Bank Group and other multilateral development banks. We have good talks with the United Nations systems, but they are clearly separate and they work separately together. Uh, so th that's one we have to link them together, that's for sure. And we, we will press for that. But I would again like to, to answer another question and what you posed to me, and that is mm. around digitalization and human rights online. Because this yeah. is really an area where the multilateral system and the global system should take a firm stand. Otherwise, the disparate or different private companies are setting the norms and standards in an area which, a very, which is a human rights issue. Human rights should be applied online as well as offline. We, buy, we have a biannual event at CEDA called the Stockholm Internet Forum where civil society organizations are taking part, governments are taking part, but so is Google, Facebook, and others. And there is always, always a demand, especially from civil society actors, for governments and the multilateral in institutions to take a firm grip, gr grip on human rights online and set up standards and follow them, them up. That's an area where, where the multilateral system should take a a stronger grip, actually. I, I totally agree with you, and I'm glad you raised that issue because it just serves to be that that seems to be a deficit in that in the in the multilateral organization world, uh, and 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 also how do you how, how do you create norms? Is it, is it, I, I just want to put it on the table. If we divide, if we end up with a splinter net. You know, you're going to have a lot of the future of the global middle class living under one terms that is not where the transatlantic exactly. value space is, and you've got to figure that out. Anyway, that's just my little editorial comment. Um, let me come back to all of you in our in our last few minutes and, and, and come back to Jonah and, and, and Mark and, and all of you. Um, we have both a question from Sawyer Barnett, who's a student at the University of Nevada at Reno, um, about the call for um, uh, an international summit on democracy and what can the transatlantic uh, relationship do? What can NATO do uh, to strengthen democracy in the other areas? And then Pedro Siebra, and I apologize if I butchered names, asked, should membership accession to multilateral institutions have more explicit democracy clauses? Should there be elements of that where we're building in and baking in to some of these institutions more uh, uh, of the guardrails for democracy? So let me start with with uh, Mircea and then jump to Mark. Mircea? And we have like four minutes, so maybe a minute each. Okay, let, let me say also one word about NATO and European Union cooperation, sure. because I'm in charge of this on behalf of the SecGen. I try to do a right. lot on NATO EU. Because speaking of regulating and speaking of creating a new, not only uh, democracy that delivers for our citizens, but it's equally true that our economic model is in huge transition and transformation. Right. That our social contract is under huge transformation and transition. That the big portion of the new technologies impact and everything we do from security and defense to daily life of our citizens around the world 
are unregulated at all. And I'm giving you the example of something mm -hmm. we are working, NATO and the EU. Just give you an real example. fast. Yeah. yeah, on artificial intelligence. And how do you use ethically, morally, in accordance to an international law that still doesn't exist? Right. So my call to all of you, private sector, public sector, multilevel institutions, uh, NGOs, universities from Reno, Nevada, let's try also for the things that are now in flux. Some things are in flux, some things are not mm -hmm. yet written. Right. These things need to be done together. That's my message. I'm doing this from NATO EU. I think Got whenever it. UN is needed, we should go to them. When the OECD is needed, we should go to them. When we need also our civil society, academia, and private sector, and the media, right. we should try to do something together. Thank you. Great idea. Great proposal. Mark? Very quickly. I mean, in 2000, when the UNS adopted the Millennium Assembly re report and resolution, it was, I think, the one time in the UN's history where even China um, signed up to a unanimous resolution uh, that democracy was the ideal end state of political development. So there are moments of consensus in international affairs where you do get that secured, but you've got to accept that most of the time divisions don't allow that. And that, you know, I think it'd be a great mistake to condition membership of the UN on something like uh, democracy credentials. Biden's summit, the other half of the question, you know, there's a real problem. Is it a summit of democracies or a summit for democracies? Because mm. He's included in its numbers countries like uh, India uh, and some others, which are quite kind of dodgy democracies at the moment, where there's a mm. lot of infringement of you know, full democratic freedoms and human rights. And why? Because the other purpose of this summit is a, an anti-China alliance, if I can put it that way. So mm. there is a confusion amongst the strategic purposes of the US to build a geographic alliance against China, versus building a values alliance against China. And these do not always coincide. And I think, you know, this summit is struggling a bit to kind of clarify its, its purposes and objectives in that context. Thank you for that, for that perspective, Mark. Jonathan? Yeah, I think this, the Democracy Summit uh, is, is, is a, a destination in the democracy agenda for this administration. Uh, they've laid out corrupt, uh, countering corruption, human rights, uh, uh, you know, addressing uh, kleptocracy. Uh, these are the things that are on the agenda. They're things that are already being discussed in all these communiques, the summits this week. So I think this has been important. Right. The most important thing for the summit is that it be inclusive. I think that's what people are touching on. Um, and that, that if you aren't including, for example, uh, one country, you are reaching out to civil society, private sector. Right. And I think that the most important message about this democracy summit is probably right. something that may not be the focus is strengthening democracy at home. And that's something that, that, that needs to be in focus. Absolutely, Karen, I'm gonna get, Karen, yeah. I'm going to give you the last words. You, 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 you can bring it home. So hit a home run. I'll be very brief. I have, the, I had the same question marks as Mark spelled out. So I will not repeat that. Mm. I'll just say I'm very happy that we are now discussing a democracy summit held by a democ democratically elected U.S. leader. Uh, from this, we can build a stronger democracy in the world. But there are many hurdles to be to be um, overcome before we we get there. Thank you. Look, I, I think this was a terrific discussion. And what I really enjoyed from each of you is the tension in this topic uh, is important. I think this topic has often had been discussed in years past as if gravity was taking us into a better place. But clearly, uh, I think the stakes are high in this topic of reimagining democracy or resecuring democracy. Um, and so I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Jonathan Katz, Senior Fellow and Director for Democratic Initiatives at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, Mircea Genoa, uh, Deputy Secretary General of NATO. Uh, great to have you with us. Uh, Karin Jamtin, Director General of the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. Mark Malik Brown, President of Open Society Foundations. And thanks for all the great work Open Society does in all of these multilateral institutions. Thank you all for joining us. This concludes. And thank you to our questioners. There were great questions. Thank you for the patience. I think we got to all, to, to all of them. Uh, so thank you all. And thanks to the German Marshall Fund Brussels Forum for inviting us. Thank you all. Thank you.